Good evening, everybody. So glad to have you here for today's webinar brought to you by the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. I'm very excited to have a wonderful presenter tonight. Her name is Dr. Lindsay Portnoy, and she's a cognitive scientist with over a decade of experience in the study and instruction of cognition, human development, and assessment of teaching and learning from birth through adolescence. Portnoy is a former public school teacher, yay, and professor of education, having worked in elementary, undergraduate, and graduate classrooms. She works with teachers and students across the nation in formal and informal settings, including the American Museum of Natural History, the New York Botanical Gardens, and the New York Hall of Science. To develop immersive learning experiences rich in complex content and engaging to learners. Portnoy publishes in both academic journals and widely read media publications, including the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development, Digital Culture, Culturist, Getting Smart, and Ed Surge, and is a member of the World Economic Forum's Expert Network in Media, Entertainment, and Information, a former Hunter College Assessment Fellow, and a 2015 ASCD Emerging Leader. Portnoy writes and conducts research at the intersection of emerging technology, developing cognition and assessment for teaching and learning. She currently serves as co-founder and chief learning officer at Killer Snails and lecturer at Northeastern University. Her forthcoming book on the science of learning, Underlying Design Thinking, will be published through ASCD in October 2019. And I'm proud to say we've spent the last 10 minutes or so <laughs> discussing Fortnite with our sons. So I think uh, we're, we're going to have a good time tonight. And I'm going to... Um, sign off and it's all yours dr portnoy thank you bertha thank you so much for having me i'm delighted to be here and honored to be invited i'm going to see if i can share my screen here let me know if there's a little that looks like we are in business you are in business excellent well hello look at that we have a reminder for the webinar here we are um so before we get started uh, if everyone who is currently logged in could take a moment and take out uh, your smartphone uh, or your cell phone rather, and if you could text to the phone number 37607, if you could text the message Lindsay, P O R T N 260, you'll be able to join our room. And I'll have a couple different polls throughout this experience. So we're not in person, but I wanted to make it as interactive as possible. So if you could uh, go ahead and text to, uh, that message to that number. And then when you join the room, if you could text us, what is the first game that you ever played? Okay, I'm still working on typing this in, so give everybody a second. Sure, take your time. The first game I ever played and everybody else. Oh, look, somebody already answered. That's amazing. You guys are fast t uh, texters. Not forget, Frogger. Frogger. Nice Not one. Yeah, all right. Monopoly. I'm saying Minecraft too. You're saying Minecraft. You guys have to get a text it in. That's Brendan. <laughs> Minecraft. Nice. More Minecraft. Oh, come on, friends. I do hide and seek and tag, Frogger, Monopoly, Dance. Anyone play Dance Dance Revolution? All right, let's give you guys a few more minutes. You might have to text a couple of times to have it come through. Shoots and ladders, is that shoots and ladders? Shoots and ladders. Very nice. Connect four, look at that. We got some classics, we've got some new stuff. Wow. Are the ones most often uh, texted getting bigger? Absolutely. So the ones that folks are, are responding to most regularly, so we have Pac-Man, I believe uh, they they are the larger ones. Candyland, oh yes, good stuff. Good stuff. All right, I'm going to take about 10 more seconds. If you haven't had a chance, chess. All right, I didn't speak. Excellent. So we have some gamers here this evening. Wonderful. Hopefully we have some students as well as some teachers. Um, Administrators, friends, family, fellow countrymen. Um, excellent. Oh, Battleship. That's a good one. We love Battleship, yeah? All right. So we're going to move along, but but stay uh, plugged in to this uh, poll because we're going we're gonna to revisit this uh, 
Oh, there's more stuff coming in. We're gonna revisit this throughout. So so please stay in. Oh, somebody wrote Mario. Thank you. Thank you, whoever wrote Mario. Uh, great game. So hi, so first of all, thank you again so much for having uh, me. I wanted to quickly sort of go over uh, who I am and why I'm here uh, tonight before I hop into the science of play. And I wanna do that by first starting by saying it takes a village. Truly it does. Um, I'm here this evening as part of an organization called Killer Snails that was founded uh, uh, myself, my colleague, Dr. Mandy Holford and Jessica Ochoa Hendricks. Um, Dr. Holford uh, was teaching in, or is rather a, a science educator, uh, scientist rather at Hunter College, had been awarded an i grant to bring her research on these venomous marine snails out of the lab and use them to sort of engage young folks in, in science learning, to help them see themselves as scientists by, by engaging with real science. Uh, and that i -Corps grant um, funded her work. And then her and I met both at Hunter College through an award that we had won through Faculty Innovations in Teaching with Technology um, while she was working on that particular grant. At the same time, she had been giving this wonderful talk at the Secret Science Club where she met with our CEO, Jessica Joa Hendricks. Uh, and the three of us sort of came together and we were like, you know, I wonder how we can use these, these um, extreme creatures of nature to truly engage kids in learning science and getting them more excited about science learning. And so we partnered um, with the American Museum of Natural History, where Dr. Holford is jointly appointed. We worked with a team of educators and high school, middle school students uh, and folks at the museum to create a game, which then went on to be kickstarted uh, very successfully. Um, and we realized that we were onto something. So we realized that as you saw before, Everyone loves to play. It's 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 our nature. I would say human nature, but it's it's just nature that we love to play. And as we play, we really do learn a great deal. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and it was so successful that that then when we did apply for the NSF funding, um, the SQIR to NSF, we were successfully funded to start creating more of these immersive, engaging gaming experiences where learners were having again experiential learning. Um, playing and, and, and learning by doing, by taking on the role of scientist. We then met up with a bunch of, of amazing, incredible individuals. Uh, one of our, our uh, Google expeditions was featured last year during Women's History Month. Uh, there was one specifically about the games that we create, and, as well as Dr. Holford's exciting research, which I strongly suggest everyone take a look at. Um, and then we partnered with folks like the New York uh, Hall of Science as designers and residents to, to bring their exhibits to life. We've been uh, blessed to work with a lot of great organizations. The Small Business Administration of New York uh, had awarded us as uh, the, the New York Small Business of the Year. We work with other organizations like CNA Scientific. So again, it takes a village. I'm here uh, based on the work that, that all of us have, have strived and, and, and done for the past several years. Um, but you are here tonight to learn about the cognitive science underlying games and why games are a really perfect medium for learning. So let's talk about the body and the brain and what I like to call the striking similarity between play and gray matter. Um, so we start out with the need for speed, right? So we have this Bugatti, which goes 254 miles per hour. Pretty impressive, unless you put it next to the mighty neuron, uh, which synapses fire at over 260 miles per hour. Going back to the Bugatti, can hold two passengers. That's sort of impactful, but nothing when you compare it to one of those neurons, which can transport a thousand trillion messages. So here we have a single neuron which scientists have found can be connected to over 10,000 others. So perhaps the neuron itself is the nexus of the universe. This is a shout out on the right here to any of you who, who remember Seinfeld, right? Perhaps the neuron is truly the nexus of the universe and, then, and certainly the nexus of our learning universe. Um, but learning science and cars have a lot more in common than speed. In fact, the reason why I like to use cars is because uh, the word car is a perfect acronym for one of my favorite theories of cognitive science and, and motivation, which is uh, the self-determination theory. And what self-determination theory tells us, and, and many of you educators out there will agree with, is that folks are most um, motivated and engaged with learning when they feel a sense of competence, autonomy, and relatedness. Competence that is that they feel like they have a, a, a great understanding of the content that they're supposed to master, autonomy in the choice in which they enact that knowledge, uh, and relatedness, meaning that the way that they demonstrate their knowledge makes them feel like they're part of a community. Um, I'd like to mention 
mentioned earlier that we did talk briefly a bit before, and so um, you might, some of you out there might be familiar with this, but a really great example of how cognitive science and learning science sort of is foundational to why people are so engaged with games is a, is a little known game that some of you might be familiar with um, called Fortnite. Uh, and in Fortnite, we really see these values of competence, autonomy, and relatedness, right? So if the idea of competence is that folks are learning content um, and, and, and replaying it and, and spawning many, many times, right? If you've ever watched somebody play Fortnite, you see that they are you know, oftentimes losing more than they're winning, but they still go back and they replay and they want to learn. And every time they go back, they're improving. So they have a strong drive to be competent to master the content. It's a really great example of autonomy. Um, you see in Fortnite when you're when you're uh, you know diving in from the battle bus that you have a choice and where you would like to go. Right, every season uh, the map changes, it alters a little bit, and the players, the users, the individuals are able to have a voice and a choice and where they drop and where they play. And then, lastly, and also equally important, is the sense of relatedness. Um, Fortnite is such a great example of how when individuals share a language and share a goal, uh, they move successfully forward together. So competence, autonomy, and relatedness, which are sort of the, the linchpins of, of self-determination theory, are beautifully exemplified in this game called Fortnite. Um, but is it really just child's play? Uh, in fact, no. What, what developmental psychologists have seen, evolutionary scientists have seen, is that Play uh, occurs in all of, of the species, right? And in fact, there's research that demonstrates how earlier motor and social development um, happens because of, of greater play. A greater sense of play is correlated to earlier motor development. Um, that play also is foundational for the development of executive functioning skills. That play is also a skill that, under, that underlies the ability to self-assess. And if you think about it, you think about what individuals are doing when they're playing and how they're checking themselves against their, their peers. Um, so it's not really just child's play, it's all of animals' play. And in fact, what we know about play is that it actually helps us uh, build relationships, right? And perhaps bigger brains in the process, this reciprocal face-to-face -face communication that takes place when uh, infants, for instance, are imitating their caregivers very, very soon after being born is an early form of social learning. So we learn by seeing others. We learn by feeling related and competent autonomous, right? But then also there's the social aspect here to play. Uh, now, the way that we attend to information in our environment, in the classroom, um, in the laboratory, in, in the lunchroom, wherever we are, um, is largely related in this, this child too. Um, how, how the child attenuates or pays attention to information or stimuli in the environment um, is also a result of something that we can, we can talk about from the lens of cognitive science, uh, attention, perception, and their impact on learning. It's it's you know important and to acknowledge, and I think many of us already do, that attention and perception are two uniquely different constructs. Both of them, of course, foundational for learning. Uh, attention is, in fact, the selective response to stimuli or simply what you're focusing on, whereas perception is our constructed reality. So I'm going to give you an example. You might be familiar with this image. So based on what you are attending to in this image before you, um, your perception may show you a, a woman looking over her right shoulder or an older woman looking down. And it's largely based on whether your attention uh, focuses on this piece here as her ear, the young woman's ear looking over her shoulder, or whether it's her eye looking down. So the difference between perception and attention, I want to dig a little deeper. For those of you who've seen a Stroop test, I really enjoy doing a Stroop test um, with folks, but we can't really do that. So hopefully you have your smartphones ready. You ready to play a game? I'm going to pretend that everyone's nodding yes here, uh, and we're going to play. So get ready. Perception and attention. When you find the mistake, oh no, when you find the mistake, text your favorite emoji. Once you find it, text your favorite emoji. Do you see it? What mistake? I don't know. Somebody sees it. All right. Nice. Two people. Three, four. Well done.
Nice. So if you can't see the mistake, I would challenge you to read the first line and then stop and then read the second line. But because of the way that we are familiar with reading, our brain sort of fills in the blanks and we don't see that second the that is actually the mistake. Um, so fun brain teaser and also sort of an interesting fun way to talk about perception and attention. So we're gonna try another one. Let's see how good you are over here, ready? All right, so text your answer. Oh, somebody already found it. Text the answer to this brain teaser. What is the word that these, that this image is trying to relay? Man overboard, well done, well done. All right, last one, are you ready for the last one, man overboard? Here we go. So, what do you see? Oh, I could see two things. Yeah, whatever you see first. Okay, whatever I see first. A tabby, a duck and a rabbit, rabbit and a duck. Excellent. So depending on your prior experience, right, your experiences, you may see the duck with its bill pointing up and to the left of your screen, or a rabbit with its nose pointing to the right of your screen, right? So your perception also guides your attention and informs what you see. All right, so those were a couple of, of fun sort of, of tricks and, and ways in which our perception and our attention, our attention are rather different. So our perception is truly a constructed reality, right? They're not the same thing. We have the schema or the mental models that we make based on our prior knowledge that guide our attention. So for instance, in this comic in front of you, um, you know, perhaps the prior experience that the folks trying to push this um, wagon o' rocks have had with that gentleman to the left was not such a strong prior experience, or else they would be saving themselves quite a bit of time by using his wheels. Uh, so again, perception is really constructed reality, and uh, the context, right, surrounding uh, what we see uh, matters and motivates us. So here are a couple of my favorite examples using comics. Um, the first one on the left is how to motivate your kid to learn a second language. Here we see a father at the ATM with his child saying, if I select Spanish, now you have to see how much uh, to withdraw from your, how to withdraw your allowance, right? Using a foreign language, that's how you teach it. Um, and in fact, one of my favorite in our house, the miracle of Hanukkah updated. The cell phone only had enough battery power for one day, but it lasted eight days. So the context, right? Uh, the environment matters and it also motivates learners. We see this in the classroom every single day. Um, and we know that folks have uh, essentially the same cognitive architecture, but with these different experiences, they have different life experiences and you attend to, like you saw with the rabbit and the duck, uh, different aspects of, of even the same shared environment, right? So we all just looked at the exact same photograph and yet different folks saw different things in a different order. Um, Bronfenbrenner uh, talks about the, the ecological system that surrounds you and how your interactions with people in your immediate uh, area as well as their interactions with folks outside of their immediate ecosystem. So for instance, your interaction with your family and your interaction with your school is also impacted by sort of these larger constructs. Um, so again, we have different experiences and all of these experiences help to shape and shift our perception and what we attend to in the world around us. We also know from context um, and the science of learning in games that there's this idea of zone of proximal development. Our friend Vygotsky talked to us about this years ago that essentially says that with the help of a more knowledgeable other, there is more than an individual can do on their own than, with they, than when they are with this more knowledgeable other. And here we have on the right, uh, Brendan, forgive me if this is an older image of this, but we have Ninja, who is the more knowledgeable other, that if you have children or if you've watched children play, uh, they are equally as engaged to watch Ninja on YouTube playing Fortnite, and they do learn a great deal and develop and hone their strategy for playing this game if only you could leverage it for good which we'll talk about. Um, and so watching Ninja as this more knowledgeable other in Fortnite uh, Battle Royale is, is similar to this idea of, of 
proximal zone of proximal development where he is, you know, it could be a peer, it could be, um, it, it doesn't always have to be a teacher, but this guy down the side, this more knowledgeable other could really be anybody that has a bit more uh, experience with the content. So again, different experiences, different outcomes. Cognitive science tells us over and over again that that how, what the experiences that we have in, in our environments impact the way that we interact in our environments. One of my favorite quotes is, I hated history until the History Channel came out, and probably because it didn't make sense to this particular individual. But once it was contextualized, it became um, more impactful. Also a great way to share a Simpsons image. There's always a good reason to share that. So the science of learning and the making of games, how are these two related? So using how, how people learn, what we know about how individuals learn, uh, we were wondering, and, and when I'm talking about we, I'm talking about um, us and our, and our team at Killer Snails, how can we take what we know about how people learn, what gets them excited and motivated to learn, and how can we create more meaningful play, more intentional play, more goal-directed play? Um, and in doing so, how can we represent the different experiences um, that that our players may have, that our students may have, that the learners would have, and also how could we possibly represent different voices in creating these these playful, these gaming experiences, right? So we have meaningful, rich experiences that 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 represent um, you know folks across the spectrum and are not, and are not um, you know and, and are and are as unique as the, as the kids in our classroom. Uh, so we looked at how we learn. And we understand and we know that knowledge is interdisciplinary, right? That the best way to learn is when you when you work in an applied way, when it's experiential, when it's multimodal, when you're hearing, sensing, feeling, tasting, talking at the same time. Well, not exactly at the same time, but you know what I'm talking about. When you're active, when you're moving around, when you're working with others, when you're collaborating. So we know that this is how people learn, right? And yet, Oftentimes, this is how, how we see learning happening in, in, in siloed content areas where there's math separate from science, separate from reading or writing. Um, and that's actually not, not how folks learn. Um, so we wondered, how could we use games, which really represent a lot of the best aspects of cognitive science, to create playful learning experiences that also have you know, rich assessment baked into the experience? Um, it's playful, it's collaborative, right? You, see, you have to work with one another, talk about all of those social emotional skills of, of problem solving. Um, again, it's social, we can, we can use a great amount of content in the games that we create, and it's low stakes. It's not as, as scary as some other forms of learning may be, and it's very applied, right? So you're learning by doing. Uh, our question at Killer Snails was how can we create these impactful experiences to prepare our children to take on these new roles in our uncertain future? We talk about the fourth industrial revolution and what this new uncertain future looks like. And we wonder how can we leverage emerging technologies to create playful experiences that kids, our students want to play and can also learn at the same time. So our mission is largely to take science out of the lab and, and place science into the, into the hands of players or people um, worldwide, so out of the laboratory and into classrooms. And we've done this in a couple of different ways. Um, well, first we start by listening to the voices of all stakeholders. Uh, that means reaching out to educators and um, administrators to hear what it is, what are the, the pain points in their curriculum that they would like to see met by new learning experiences, what are the areas that are most complicated to teach and how can we use those as an opportunity to innovate and sort of leverage our technology um, tools to create playful experiences. Uh, we talk to kids, what do they like? What do they enjoy? We play test constantly with students and we ask them, you know, what was something that you wish you could change? If you could change anything, what would it be? Um, what was the most frustrating part of this experience? You know, what would you want to tell the person who made this game if you could fix it? What is something you would say to them? Uh, and then of course we work with our developers to continuously um, create and iterate on our design. So we see here a couple of different examples. We have tons of public schools that we work with and, and hundreds and hundreds, thousands if not of children, but I can't share those images here because those are public schools. So these are the best I have for you right now. Um, so we listen to all of the stakeholders and, and the latest experience that we've created is BioDive. 
Um, and we've created this hybrid learning for experiential learning that truly represents what we know to be the, the science of learning. Uh, we talked about self-determination theory earlier. In BioDive, the student is the scientist and they're solving a problem in, in their um, in their experience, uh, it's there's the anchoring phenomenon is this venomous marine snail that engages the kids. And as they go through their science journal, which is digital based, you see here on the left, this competence, where we're developing competence, um, students are going through their digital science journal, just like scientists do, and acquiring information. And then through virtual reality, they go into the field and they make observations and they act on the, um, the, the components of the, the, the abiotic and the biotic features within their environment in this virtual world. And then what the teacher sees is continuous real-time updates about where the students are in their learning, what types of content they've been engaging with, and where the students are in their learning journey. So students have a sense of competence that they develop through the, the, jour the journal. Um, they have a sense of autonomy in the choices that they make in their virtual reality. They can choose where they'd like to go on an expedition. And at each different dive site, there, there are two different locations that they'll experience at each dive site where they'll be able to compare and contrast the abiotic data that they collect from the surface of the water to the biotic variables that they see once they are underwater on the dive. And then, of course, they toggle back just as scientists do. They go back to their laboratory and continue to hone that confidence by demonstrating what it is um, that their hypothesis is about why the variables may or may not be changing. And there's a sense of relatedness in the fact that the students are working together um, either in teams um, as a class to try and solve this this puzzle, to try and solve the scientific phenomena. And the, and the teacher, of course, is getting real-time feedback to be able to meet the kids where they are in that zone of proximal development, to give the feedback where they need it, um, and that students are able to demonstrate their knowledge and their unique perspective in that journal, which of course is the affordance of digital over virtual reality. Um, that's a different conversation. We can have we can have that one later if you're interested. Um, so we have a whole host of games, and uh, I told you a little bit about BioDive, Bio which is our uh, virtual reality game. We have right now Scuba Adventure, which which is also a virtual reality game, and these are available for Google Cardboard. So so super easy to access. We have a couple of augmented reality experiences and of course the good old-fashioned tabletop games which are which are really fun um, and for a variety of, of learners. Uh, we're also we have a couple of digital games as well but we have a host of different games and really the idea is that the that the player right if you're playing Fortnite and instead of picking a skin why don't you pick the skin of a scientist and why not try to be um, a marine biologist today, um, a marine biochemist tomorrow. Uh, an ecologist, you know, but taking on the role of scientists in a playful and fun way to engage and motivate and deepen the learning of students and help them really see themselves as learners, and then in seeing themselves as learners, seeing that they can take on these roles in their future. So just to tie it all together, because I did talk about a whole bunch of different things, um, if there are four things that, that maybe we use as takeaways, uh, hopefully you've seen now that your car, your competence, autonomy, and relatedness is better than a Bugatti anyway. That context matters. Uh, perception is constructed reality, as we see by this rhinoceros who has seen a variety of sunsets, but in each sunset sees his own nose. Um, we know that sometimes ninjas are the more knowledgeable other that Vygotsky was talking about. Uh, and we know this when we creatively group, when we flexibly group kids in the classroom and when we use jigsaw type methods or fish bowls, that, that this is oftentimes how we learn by watching and learning from others and pairing students in creative and unique ways. Um, and that play is serious business, right? Thanks, Albert Einstein. Play is the highest form of research. Um, or according to Fred Rogers, that play is the work of childhood. So we know the play is serious business. We know that there's a lot of really amazing learning that happens when, when we play, all of us, um, including adults, and maybe we should try playing more often. Um, and again, I just want to go back and say that Everyone knows this quote. If I've seen further, it's because I'm standing on the shoulder of giants. There is so much that we already know, and yet so much that we have yet to learn. And one of the most inspiring and, and humbling things is working with folks who are 
oftentimes more, you know, more aware of these things than you are, and that together we grow and we learn and, and we build together, and that we're constantly iterating and revising, uh, you know, our expectations and our assumptions about what games might be exciting for kids or what experiences might be exciting for kids, and even the content within is constantly being iterated and revised and honed. So I told you about the shoulders upon upon which we're all standing. These are some of the shoulders upon which I'm standing today. Uh, this is the Team Killer Snails. Uh, the top, those are my, my two uh, fabulous uh, co-founders. And uh, this is the folks responsible for, for the experiences that we create and we bring into classrooms uh, in the hopes of helping students see themselves as scientists. And that is all I have for you this evening. Wonderful, wonderful. I've got quite a few questions. Oh boy, okay, I'm gonna toggle back so they can see all of us. Okay, um, I'll go I'll go ahead, I'll do this. I was covering myself. So the first thing is a comment, not a question. I think it's interesting from a, a someone named Adrian. Adrian says that there should be Fortnite skins of scientists. There are. Oh. I agree. Okay. There are, but it could be done more intentionally. I'm with you, Brendan. We can do that much more intentionally. I hope someone from Epic is listening. Yeah, that would be good. So first question you got towards the beginning of the talk was, um, so are they beneficial to mental health, these video games? Um, someone answered, and then I'll let you answer. They said that they did their own research on this and wrote an essay in class, and that um, let me tell you what the essay, what they said. They said, I wrote an essay the other day, this is Griffin, on how too much is bad, too much video gaming is bad, but in the short term, they improve visual attention, multitasking, and eye-hand coordination. And Nicholas asked, so are video games beneficial to mental health? Is there any data on that? Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of data about video games and, and health and video games and engagement in video games and attention. Uh, in fact, what we found in our research is that uh, when when students are playing, particularly BioDive, because we've been collecting um, sort of data about this, students often see themselves as scientists more regularly when they when they have these experiences. So I'm not sure specifically mental health issues, but but there have been um, we've seen improvements in efficacy, which is students' ability to see themselves as a scientist, which I think is a really powerful indicator of whether or not people may choose to go into a particular field like science. Um, so I don't know, I mean, there's there's a lot of great research out there I would love to share with you. In fact, afterwards I can share a whole host of citations that video games are actually, can be very beneficial. I think it depends on how you use them. In fact, one of, um, one of one of the researchers that that I that I work with and, and know well encourages folks to play with their kids, right? And then it's oftentimes the interactions that you have with your children or with your students while they're playing that can deepen and make more meaningful those gaming experiences. So I would say categorically, no, video games are not bad for you or bad for your mental health. Specifically about the games that um, that teach or or supposedly teach certain cognitive reflexes i mean that's that's training anything that you do will hone that particular that particular um, ability or motor function or whatever it is my question for that study would be is that a transferable skill because what i'm always wondering is if you're using a game to teach something are you teaching something that then can be transferred and applied in a real world setting that then becomes meaningful and impactful to the learner and empowers them i understand now we've got questions coming up in the chat and questions under these question and answers. So I'm going to try to keep uh, keep this straight. You sort yeah. of already answered this, but would video games used in education promote intuition? What do you in students? Um, well, so I think that's a really good question. So if you're saying would video games help students be able to make better predictions or make better decisions, if I, if I, can I take it that in that direction? Because okay. I, I, I would say that, yes, there are plenty of games. In fact, there's um, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Karen uh, Schreier is publishing, she's published several books on this, but there's a learning and education games book that's actually coming out I'll have to find out exactly when for you. It's actually the third piece of a of several different books, and and it talks largely about the types of experiences that are great for for teaching and learning. And so, for that particular question, I would say 
simulation games are fabulous for that, of course. I think, again, it depends on the type of game experience that, you're, that you have access to and also what is the skill that you're trying to teach. Uh, if you want to teach empathy and perspective teaching, you can you can drop kids into a game um, like Mission US, where they have to take the perspective of folks historically and sort of understand what it was like to be, um, or, or a migrant trail, right, where you have to, you understand what it is to be um, somebody who's, who's recently come to this country and, and how that feels. And so there are a lot of really powerful lessons that games can teach us. I like this question a lot from Julieta Martinez. And I guess I could almost answer this too, but it's, so if we know that we best learn using our senses and a more playful learning experience, why hasn't that been pushed into our educational systems? And we have a curriculum specialist from uh, Chicago with us. Maybe she can respond to that as well. I mean, I have my answer, but why don't you go ahead, please? No, no, you go, you're the expert. Well, no, I, I think that that's a really, um, what it's you a good question thing is that um, I, I don't know that that I'm the expert or that anyone's the expert, but I certainly know that the people that are more expert um, are not making those decisions. And uh -huh. so I think part of the problem is that the folks who are making the decisions about what constitutes as quality curriculum are oftentimes not those that have the expertise to be making those decisions. I understand. I feel like even in my own classroom, I used to do more fun types of things like that, but now I've got this test looming at the end of the year that I have to make sure the kids get the information for. I think text, uh, state tests run contrary to everything that we're seeing right here. I couldn't agree with you more. I could not agree with you more. I think that, that state tests are detrimental to the, the most incredible aspects of teaching and learning, which are like the, the, the application of knowledge, right? There's yeah. never going to be a time in your life where you're going to need to sit for six hours to demonstrate that you can read and write and do basic math. It's just not going to happen. It's not reality. I mean, there are certain aspects, certainly if you're uh, going to medical school or, or law school, and there will be certain tests that are specific to the domain, but a lot of these are, are really just not a good use of, of time, in my opinion. This is cool. This is coming from our presenter from next week for next week, who's a, a zoologist and archaeopaleontologist, I believe, uh, Dr. Scott Thompson. Games to be successful need an internal reward system. Apart from the satisfaction of completion, what reward systems do you have in these games? Meaning, I suppose the games you you were referring to earlier. This interests me both as a zoologist, but also I build games as a hobby. First of all, thank you, great question. And we should definitely chat, post this chat, um, because we work with a lot of scientists and we are, uh, one of the, the, the slides that I shared is the fact that we think it's important to have the voice of all stakeholders and that includes experts in these fields, right? So we're not coming in and saying, we know everything about marine biochemistry. We reach out to a marine biochemist and then we reach out to you know an AP or IV uh, marine biochemistry teacher and say, what do your kids have to learn? So. So again, inviting the voices of the stakeholders. Um, but there's something interesting in that question, and that is um, the assumption that there has to be some sort of internal reward system baked in. And what I would say is that oftentimes the beauty of games is that, you know, there's intrinsic and then extrinsic motivation. I think sometimes the playing of the game is the fun itself. And something that we learned from Piaget. Um, My son is nodding his head that you're absolutely right about that. Well, and it's funny because we do. Thank you, Brendan. And thanks for the help with the Fortnite 8, um, the, the battle bus. That was very helpful. I appreciate it. Um, there, there's extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. And if we want to truly motivate people for a long period of time, it can't be extrinsic, right? So extrinsic rewards are the state tests. Intrinsic rewards are playing for the joy of feeling competent, autonomous, and related. Those are motivational, um, internal sort of um, internally motivating constructs, right? Like you're gonna you're gonna die in Fortnite. It's gonna happen. I mean, unless you're ninja or who is a Tfue, um, whatever. There are a host of folks, but you keep respawning. You keep jumping back into the game for the joy of playing. Um, however, there always is a goal to the game in Fortnite. You want to win. Um, in our game, you're trying to, particularly in biodive, you're trying to solve the puzzle. You're reporting back to your chief scientist, who is your classroom teacher, about how these abiotic factors are impacting the biotic factors at your location because there has been a, um, 
a greedy company that has opened up shop on the shores of, of the Indo-Pacific and the Eastern Atlantic and um, and you're trying to, to figure out what exactly is happening so that you can you can stop this from from you know potentially destroying these ecosystems. So the impetus, of course, and, and if you want to call it the external reward, is is stopping uh, you know this hazardous pollution and hopefully the students get invested in it through the narrative. Um, but hopefully the joy is in playing, right? If you've ever played Uno, the joy is in playing. Uh, and and one of our games, uh, Biome Builders, is similar-ish. Um, and and really, it's just a fun. It's just fun to play. And as you're going yeah. along, you're learning. So um, that's a good answer to a very good question. And I should say, everybody, next week's uh, webinar will be on a living fossil. Um, it's a turtle that Dr. Scott Thompson discovered. So that, that would be a good one too. Here's actually a personal question. Um, I mentioned you you studied at Hunter College in New York. Yes, yes. And, oh, no, 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 and, I taught at Hunter College. I'm sorry, I didn't study there, I taught there. Oh, okay. So yes, because she's asking, one of the people's asking if it's the one in New York. I think yes, is. that, that is. is correct. Okay. Yes. So we're based in New York City and Dr. Holford and I were both faculty at Hunter College when we met. Uh, and I, I sort of briefly went over it at the beginning, but that's how we met. She was in the science department and I was in the School of Education. And we came together because we were both trying to find, innov it was faculty innovations in teaching with technology. It was all about how can we make our, um, our teaching methods more exciting and more engaging. So we already sort of had that mentality of how can we, right. how can we get our students more excited about what we're learning. And I think the next generation science standards does try to address that. Um, here's a question that I think is interesting. I think you you addressed it a little bit at the beginning, but do different demographics, like for example, someone's age or ethnicity, react? Do they react differently to the to games in general? Or you said it's even in elephants and birds, and so I would assume humans in general react the same. But what's the case there? I mean, we all all of us enjoy playing games, right? I mean. Even even the the, the peekaboo that we play with our children when they're born is is a game, right? And we are learning object permanence, Piaget, um, that through play we're learning. So I would say that we that that I don't know that it changes per se strictly by demographic or or any sort of other indicator that you might use. I think just by personal preference, some folks prefer more of like a narrative driven game. Some some folks you know, pr prefer puzzle games. I mean, Rubik's Cube, that's technically a game, right? It's, it's a goal-directed behavior that there is, there is like a, you know, a summative end to it. Um, something that I think is interesting, and, and when Brendan nodded, he said earlier, I was thinking about it, is in Piaget, those of you who remember, uh, Piaget talked about human development and the way that oftentimes you'll see kids planning a game at recess, for those of you who teach in elementary school or work with maybe K to six populations, uh, students oftentimes will spend more time creating rules than actually playing the game. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right? So it, there's something about this social interaction and even like the preparing to play that is really powerful. And it's a really interesting sort of dynamic. And, and I think it speaks a lot to the way that we, that we need to learn from one another how to be human and how to like engage with others. Um, and again, it's a powerful, I think it's a powerful aspect of, of play and experiential learning in general, right? This is what this is, it's experiential learning. Yeah. So what about, here's a question from Jonathan Brazda. Um, are competitive games more educational or? Well, I, think edu I think competitive games wants to make you win. So you're more likely to do stuff that you wouldn't normally do to win it as opposed to coll collaborative goals where people are working together yeah is there any difference um i'm going to tell you that honest to goodness i don't have an empirical based um response to that i don't i can give you a, a gut response which is that all of all of the the research on on the games and the efficacy and their use and, and content knowledge is is um I mean, certainly games help folks learn stuff, help students understand material in a way better than they had before. Uh, we see that games help students, um, help learners, help individuals apply that learning in a more meaningful way. 
I don't know that competitive versus non-competitive. I think that that's, again, that's a personal preference, right? Like, like my kids are not really very interested in playing the collaborative games with me that I would like to play with them just because they're not interested. Um, and that's fine. Um, I, I agree because I don't really like competitive games that much either. But I think it's a very important point because there's a lot of students here. Here's a scientist. This is what she studies. And if she doesn't know the answer, she says, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, and I, I, think that's, I think that's a really big, important lesson tonight and every night that you, sometimes science, you ask more questions and you find answers and it's okay not to know something. Um, so. I'm not going to repeat this question because it's kind of the, the same answer as the one from before. A lot of kids are talking about how in, in recess in elementary school, they made up games and they loved setting up the rules I and stuff like that. that. Every single recess that we had, um, we would have to set up like, because each person would have like a different, um, in, their, in the game that we played, each person would like select different things that they would use in the game and every single day we would spend more than half the recess for the 20 something kids to pick every the rules to pick which what they wanted well maybe there was more learning going on in recess sometimes in some of the classes not the teacher's fault of course but anyway i think you've gone through the majority of the questions here i don't want to keep you much longer you've been with us an hour i think this was terrific we got some really great questions a lot of participation there's 50 people in here right now and i love uh, that brendan was participating as well thank you so much for that and i want to see um i mean for, also thank you for having me but I, I i love that you said that we don't always have all the answers and the other thing about about being in science and, and just being a lifelong learner is not only do we not always have the answers but a lot of times the answers change and our knowledge changes and we have to also be open to to sort of shifting when we learn new stuff right exactly. like exactly when you learn new things you have to do something different um and i agree okay. that's a very big lesson for science um and for very intelligent young people to learn so thank you for that. Well, mm -hmm. folks, this has been a wonderful, wonderful webinar. It will be available uh, as a recording immediately after when I end the broadcast. I want to thank Dr. Portnoy for joining us tonight. And you know, if you have any extra copies of those games, let me know because I could, I could practice on my classes after the big state test at the end of the year, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But uh, it might be fun to try some like the killer snails and, and things like that. Yeah, so. anyone who's interested, please reach out. Um, uh, my email was on the screen. It's just lindsay at killer snails. Please reach out. I would love to uh, give you information about the games. I would love to share them with you. We're also still looking for some folks to pilot the virtual reality game if anyone's interested. Uh, so reach out. We're here. And, and there are lots of great opportunities. And thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. So me. wait, it's lindsay at killer snails dot com. Dot dot com okay everybody lindsay at killersnails.com all right no caps no, no caps doesn't matter lower caps but i don't think it matters thank you very much thank you that was great time. thanks good night bye everybody good night